All right, welcome to Unit 7, y'all. And this one is all about the Industrial Revolution and its effects on the various levels of development we see in the world. So that means in this video, we're gonna get the superhero origin story of this massive development. Or I guess it could be a super villain origin story, depending on your perspective. But whatever, if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, so right off the bat, let's define what we're talking about and when we're talking about. So by definition, the Industrial Revolution refers to the historical process by which agrarian economies were transformed into industrial economies. And agrarian economies in case you forgot, refer to economies mainly characterized by agriculture. So what we're talking about is a process that began in the middle of the 18th century that describes how some parts of the world went from farming and making goods by hand to primarily making goods with machines for a mass market. And I hope you just fell out of your chair in astonishment and melted into a pile of awe-shaped goo. And if not, then you're clearly not grasping the magnitude of this change. So let me try to explain it up for you because the Industrial Revolution is the one development that really explains so much of everything we've talked about throughout this course. So before the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted, say, a new shirt, then you'd either have to make it yourself or get a skilled artisan in the village to make it for you. And you'd better be ready to wait a while because making a shirt was not a quick process. Like cotton or wool had to be spun and then woven and then sewed together by hand. And the point is, one person made that shirt from beginning to end, and that shirt was made to your exact measurements. And with that level of skilled work, that shirt was going to be pretty expensive, so you better like it because you're going to be wearing it for the next decade. But then along came the Industrial Revolution revolution and then all of the sudden machines and factories could make about a thousand shirts in the same time it took to make a single shirt. And so no longer were skilled people required to make things because the skill was programmed so to speak into the machines. And because factories were able to mass produce goods they could take advantage of economies of scale and charge way less for those goods. And as will soon become clear this development wasn't just about consumer goods but it fundamentally changed agriculture as well. So that's the big development and maybe you're like eh what's the big whoop? Well I'll tell you what the big whoop is my dear pupil. This seemingly unimpressive development fundamentally shifted the balance of power on the world stage and has continued to do so up to this present moment. But I get ahead of myself. We'll talk about that in a minute. For now, you need to know why the Industrial Revolution began, and for that we need to talk about new technologies and natural resources. But before we get there, let me just mention that if you're starting to feel the hot, nasty breath of that AP exam breathing down your neck, then I've got something for you. It's my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, and it's the fastest way to study so that you can get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. It's got exclusive exclusive whole unit review videos, note guides to follow along, practice questions, and a full length practice exam and answers to every dang thing I just mentioned. So if doing well is the kind of thing you're into, then get that clicky finger out and have a look. Okay, so back to the two reasons that the Industrial Revolution began when and where it did. The first reason is the proliferation of new technologies during that time, and here there are two categories of technology that made a massive change. First, there were new agricultural technologies. New tools like the seed drill were developed, which enabled seeds to be planted with greater precision. You also had the mechanical reaper, which greatly increased the pace of harvesting crops, and then later tools like the steel plow were introduced, which again made planting far more precise and way faster. And I could go on naming new technologies that sprang up like mad during this period, but you only need to know a couple by name. And anyway, the point to remember about all of them is this. All of these new agricultural technologies made planting and harvesting and all the other agricultural work more efficient and thus less labor intensive. Now that's going to have some big honking effects, but I'll save those to the next section in order to keep things nice and tight. But then second, the Industrial Revolution was made possible by new technologies for producing consumer Goods. The first big innovation was the rise of the factory system. And as I mentioned before, factories were buildings in which machines did the manufacturing and therefore the necessity of skilled labor from humans significantly decreased. Previously, goods were made by hand in people's homes, but now dang near everything was being churned out by the metric buttload in factories. And then second, within those factories, new technologies were also present as well. You had the water frame, which could be positioned in moving water to provide power for the machines. And then later, the steam engine was developed, which created power for machines without the need for running water. And in order to make the goods, technologies like like the spinning jenny were introduced that mechanized the process of making textiles on a mass scale. And the same consequence that I mentioned for agricultural technology applies here. The factory system and all of its associated technology greatly increased productivity while decreasing the need for skilled human labor. Okay, now the second reason the Industrial Revolution began when and where it did was because of the abundant access to natural resources. So as it turned out, the process of industrialization began in England precisely because they had access to abundant natural resources that made industry possible, things like coal and cotton and wool. And because England had abundant coal deposits beneath its soil, they were able to dig it up and power their steam engines like a boss. But as it turns out, England didn't have all the natural resources they needed to become a boss level industrial country, all within the confines of their own little island. But don't worry, because they had spent the previous couple of centuries building up the largest sea-based colonial empire in history. So for example, since not much cotton was to be found in England, they converted much of the colonial economy of India into a cotton exporter so that Big Mama Britain could keep those textile factories churning. Okay, now as much as England would have liked to remain 
Spain the only industrial boss on the block, it was only a matter of time before this new revolution began to spread. Now, first, it spread to mainland Europe, to places like Belgium, and then Germany, and then further east, and then into the United States. But, big but, massive but, industrialization did not spread to all places equally. And this is where we start to see an explanation as to why today we observe a very particular spatial distribution of core, semi-periphery, and periphery countries. You see, those places where industrialization was adopted and took root, those are, generally speaking, the places today that we'd refer to as core countries. And those places where industrialization was not adopted, usually because they were colonies of industrial countries, became what we refer to as peripheral. And so the main reason some countries industrialized while others didn't is that industrialization only took root in places that adopted the new technologies and which also had access to the necessary natural resources. Okay, so as industrialization was spreading throughout the world, you're going to need to know that it had major social consequences as well. First, there was a significant increase in the global food supply. You see, because mechanization was being applied to farms and more land was coming under cultivation, the food supply increased significantly across industrialized nations. Second, and related to the first, there was a significant increase in population. With more food available, more people could be fed, and that led to a massive growth in the global population. Because, as I am wont to say, more food equals more babies. Additionally, because people had enough food and their diets were becoming more and more varied, their lifespans increased. And then the third effect of industrialization was a massive uptick in migration and urbanization. So before the Industrial Revolution, most of the world's population lived in rural areas and spent their lives in agricultural practices. But the Industrial Revolution came along and put the kibosh on all of that. You see, as agricultural machines were increasingly applied to the task of farming, the increased productivity meant fewer workers were needed in the field. Therefore, many rural people found themselves out of a job. But because these new centers of industrialization were cropping up in cities or else grew into cities themselves, the Industrial Revolution caused significant rural to urban migration. People fled from the country looking for jobs in the city, and in many cases, they found them. I mean, they weren't great jobs since they hardly got paid anything, and the workers were always about five seconds away from getting their fingers caught in a machine or getting tuberculosis or some other virulent disease, but, you know, they had jobs nonetheless. And then the fourth major effect of the Industrial Revolution was the growing change in class structures. So, for example, in the agricultural sector, we saw the rise of commercial farming and wage labor. So, because the new machinery that characterized industrial agriculture was exceedingly expensive, most subsistence farmers were unable to afford it, and many of them had no choice but to sell their land to large commercial farming outfits. And because these people were subsistence farmers, they had no other way to feed themselves once their land was gone. So, in many cases, they were hired by commercial farmers to work for wages or, you know, money. So all of that to say, this development created a clear social division between those fancy pants folks who owned all the farms and those chumps who just worked on the farms. But this altering of class structures also was happening in the cities as well. Those who owned the factories were known as the capitalist class, while those who worked the day-to-day -day in factories were known as the working class. And that class structure is really nothing more complicated than the rich and the poor, and that growing gap was created by industrialization. But then by the middle of the 19th century, a new class arose to fill that gap, namely the middle class, which included professionals like lawyers and teachers and office workers. And because this new economic reality created such sharp class divisions, people began identifying strongly with their class rather than a place. And that's because members of each class lived near each other and worked together and shared the same concerns with one another. Okay, so industrialization is clearly shaking the world's crap up significantly, but perhaps one of the most significant effects of industrialization was its effect on imperialism and colonialism. Now, we talked about these developments way back in Unit 3, and just to remind you, there are two distinct phases of European imperialism. The first started right at the end of the 15th century, and lasted until industrialization had become pretty widespread as a means of global economic well-being and political power. Or to say it another way, by the mid-19th century, the world's balance of power had shifted squarely to those nations which had industrialized. They were the wealthiest in the world and were thus able to dominate non-industrial nations. And so, as industrialization became firmly rooted in these powerful nations, it turned out that they got real hungry for two particular items, raw materials and new markets. In terms of raw materials, coal was needed to power machines and later oil and gasoline. And then cotton and other materials were needed to produce manufactured goods. Also, Rubber was needed for all kinds of applications in industrial factories, which ultimately led to a fresh wave of colonization focused on Africa. And then industrial nations were also hungry for new markets in which they could sell their goods. Like, because there are only so many people buying manufactured goods in their own countries, industrial nations had more goods than there were buyers. So it was kind of like an emergency to find other markets around the world that were ready to buy what they were producing. And when fat imperial nations get hungry for something, they will rummage through the global cabinet until they find what they want. And as it turned out, the only thing that would satisfy those two cravings was a second wave of of imperialism. You see, colonies could provide both raw materials that were lacking, but could also provide markets for the finished goods. For example, Britain took control of India, like I mentioned earlier, and they were made to export much of their cotton back to England. And once the cotton was made into mass-produced textiles, they could then sell them back to the Indian population. But as it turns out, there are only so many snacks in the cabinet. When we decide that building a colonial empire is the avenue to wealth and power, it's inevitable that a fight is going to occur. And many fights did occur between imperial nations as they raced to claim colonies around the world, not least in this wave 
in Africa. And that competition led to the Berlin Conference, in which European powers carved up almost the entire African continent into colonial zones, which would serve the interest of the imperial country at the expense of the colonized country. And all of that led directly to the spatial variation of development across the world that we see today. Okay, click here to keep reviewing other topics in Unit 7, and click here to get your hands on my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which is the fastest way to study. I'm glad you came around, and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.